When my son called me over to his house last Sunday, I thought it was some kind of emergency. His wife is 35 weeks pregnant and my wife and I have been sitting by the phone, waiting for the news that they were rushing to the hospital. Maybe that's a slight exaggeration, but you get my draft. We were excited to become grandparents, so I didn't even expect him to surprise me with an early birthday gift. What is this? I asked as he passed me the small envelope. My birthday wasn't for another week, so to be honest, I was thinking it had to be a simple gift card or maybe just cash. I wasn't expecting anything major. Instead, when I opened up the birthday message, I found two tickets to a local airfield inside. Now, I was both shocked and confused. No, seriously, Trevor, what is this? I said with a nervous laugh. Well, you've always been talking about having a little adventure and living on the edge, Dad. And well, you aren't getting any younger, he said, slipping his hands into his pockets. His wife nudged him a little and remarked, What he means is that he hoped you could do this together before the baby comes. I had to admit, I was speechless. He was right though. As he grew up, I've always been a bit of a wistful about the things that I missed out on. I've never been upset about raising a family or anything like that. Of course, and I made sure to let my children know that. But I guess he must have caught on to the subtle hints that I was giving for the past year. That I wanted to do something extraordinary. In my dreams, it had always been mountain climbing, snowboarding, or something like that. What he was offering was definitely unexpected. So, we'll head out to the airfield around dawn, just as the clouds are breaking. I got in touch with Pete from the college. He's got a pilot license and he can take us up as high as we want for the jump. Trevor said with a broad smile. It sounded frightening. I've never even been in a plane. And now my son was telling me that he wanted me to jump from one. But I didn't want to be rude, and so I hugged him and said, thank you. Over the next week, I'll admit I did my best to come up with an excuse for why I couldn't go. But I googled it online and realized, not only were these tickets expensive, but they weren't refundable. Oh, it's perfectly safe. People do it all the time. My wife told me when I explained my concern to her, I'm sure Trevor won't just have you going solo. You'll be fine, she added. I tried to push aside my doubts and worries to just have a good time, convincing myself this was a once-in-a-lifetime chance to really live a little. I kept checking the weather too, thinking maybe divine intervention would prevent me from going. One time, Trevor caught me doing it and reassured me. Don't worry, Dad. Pete said, even if there is a little storm, he can fly us up high. It's gonna be fine. I smiled nervously. He had no idea how scared I was. The night before the skydive, I was in the bathroom either vomiting or, well, having my dinner come out the other end. Anyway, it was nerves and stress getting the better of me. My mind wouldn't calm down about something that was supposed to be fun. Finally, I just had to psych myself up to overcome that initial fear, and then took some pills for anxiety just in case. He picked me up that morning around 6am, right before the sun was rising. I finished getting dressed and I checked the sky, noting a few dark clouds to the west. No need to worry, Dad. That's headed the other way, out of the area. He said as we climbed into his Jeep at Cherokee. The airfield was only about a 20 minute drive from my house and the whole way, I had to give myself another motivational talk in my head. Dad, you look like you saw a ghost, Trevor teased. Sorry, would you believe your old man is actually scared to death about this? I said with a half smile. He gave me the stink eye. For the past few years, you've been constantly talking about doing something like this. I don't get cold feet now, he told me. 
I nodded and apologized as our instructor showed up, waving excitedly at us both. Hey, howdy, Trevor. Bruce. Glad you both could make it. Perfect day for diving if I do say so myself, he said, walking straight over to the open hangar bay. There weren't many planes available, but it was easy to guess that the larger cargo vessel was going to be our means to get up into the cloud since it had wide doors on the side. I'm going to do a pre-flight check and you two, and you just sit tight, Pete told us with a wink. I swallowed a gulp of air and Trevor tapped his foot impatiently. Somewhere off in the distance, I heard the rumble of thunder and I reached to check my phone. Oh, and yeah, I guess I should have mentioned this. No electronic devices should be used during the flight or the jump. People usually drop them by accident and then it's bye-bye smartphone. So just drop them over here before we take off. Pete said pointing to a nearby basket. And Trevor complied immediately. And I checked the weather again just to be sure that the storm really was moving away. Then again, I thought to myself... I doubted Pete would even come out here if he thought there was a safety risk. Hey, it looks like we're good to go. Pete asked as he climbed on board and started up the instruments for the control panel. The propeller started to spin and Pete explained what was going to happen next. Once I get this old engine revved up, we'll be going to about 13,000 feet in the next 19 minutes. In the meantime, I'm going to go over a bit of basic parachute safety he shouted over the roar of the engine. And Trevor and I both did our best to listen as he piloted us higher and higher. The altitude and the velocity that we were traveling at was enough to make my stomach do some tricks. It was making it difficult to focus on what he was telling us. And then as we broke through the first layer of clouds, he got silent as he looked toward the open sky. Something wrong? I asked. He had just been explaining how to put on the safety vest when he got dead quiet and remarked, Just kind of weird. Looks like we got a storm cell in the area. I'll try to fly us a little more south. I looked out the window next to my seat to get a good look at the patch of clouds that had him concerned, realizing that I had never seen a storm from this angle. Above the clouds, watching moisture gently rise and swirl and form a cluster was both beautiful and astonishing. I'm not an expert on this, but it did seem to move a lot faster than I thought a normal patch of clouds would. Is that... is that storm following us? I asked hesitantly. Saying it out loud it sounded bizarre. I was being irrational, I told myself. But neither Trevor or Pete said a word as we flew toward the lower atmosphere to prepare for the jump. We'll need to dive a little early just to be safe, Pete told us as he repeated some of the instructions for the parachute. And then we heard a loud crack of thunder and the plane itself shook. Um, maybe we should just turn back, my son remarked. I felt like I was going to throw up after that last tumble in the air, but I told myself that I could make it. No, let's do this. I'll be okay, I reassured him. P got us to a steady altitude and checked the cloud cover. For a moment, everything looked clear. This is as good a spot as any, he told us. And then we saw that same dark storm cell push through the cloud cover, swirling like a hive of bees towards us and I felt my heart drop. It seemed like the cloud was observing us the way a stalking predator would. Then, before I could even ask my son what he thought, a long streak of lightning ripped across the sky and smashed into the cockpit of the plane. Holy crap, Pete said, grabbing a hold of the controls to keep us level. What was that? I asked. Pete jerked the controls of the small aircraft up, forcing me to grab a hold of my seat as I felt my launch go to the bottom of my stomach. And then he whirled back around and went northwest, shouting, We've got something on our tails. I don't know what, but it's nasty. Trevor and I looked toward the way that we had come, both of us speechless with panic, as we saw these strange large massive clouds that pushed towards us. The predator was on the hunt. Do you have your parachute ready? 
Pete shouted. Another bolt of lightning struck the right wing, smashing apart a third of the plating as he struggled to stay airborne. You need to jump now, Pete insisted. I looked to Trevor for a confirmation as more of the strange energy rocketed toward our tiny craft and the plane started to experience a power failure. Come on, Dad, he shouted as he opened the doors and stared down at the seemingly infinite gap between us and the ground. Dive! Go! Pete insisted as the black storm cloud was about to swarm us all. Trevor leapt first, his body immediately getting caught in the winds of the clouds and falling away from the plane to the east. I held on to the side of the plane, my pulse racing as I looked to Pete. He opened his mouth to give me another command but never got the chance. Another large bolt of lightning pierced the cockpit and ripped him from his seat, his screams echoing across the expanse for miles as I put one foot on edge toward the jump. It was now or never. I closed my eyes and plummeted. Immediately, it felt like all the oxygen had left my lungs as I fell and tumbled end over end from the plane. In one flash of my view, I saw the black cloud swarm our ship, tearing it apart the way termites would. It couldn't possibly be just another storm cell, I thought to myself. This was a breathing organism, commanding the elements to consume us as food. And then I was hurtling towards the ground, my entire life flashing before my eyes, as I searched the wide sky for any sign of Trevor. I saw him, arms outstretched about five yards away, using the specialized suit that he was wearing to ride the air down and encouraging me to do the same. I was trying not to think about what had just happened to Pete and try to focus on everything that we would need to do to make it to the ground and survive. Don't pull the parachutes until I tell you when, Trevor shouted above the roar of the wind. My brain was still trying to catch up with the decision to even jump from the plane. When I heard a loud explosion above and Trevor said, Don't look up. The wind was hitting me as my body got closer and closer to the point of no return. And then the drowning noise of the rushing air was overwhelmed by the sound of the storm. Now dad, do it now. My son shouted as he reached for his pole string and got ready for the launch of the parachute. And then these swarm of dark clouds were already on top of him as he hit the pole cord and his body shot upward. I looked up, watching as Trevor disappeared from my sight and holding on to the hope that he was fine. And then the screams came. I couldn't even imagine what was happening to my son as I heard his bones break and his cries for help get louder and louder. I knew if I pulled onto the cord now, that I would be caught in the maw of the bizarre creature too, so I hesitated for one more moment before I yanked on the release. It felt like I was flying for a moment, the sudden exhilaration of moving downward stopped by the chute opening as I drifted and swayed toward the south. I caught a glimpse of the strange black cloud that had devoured Pete and my son and saw that it was about to start following me. I panicked and tugged my body toward the tree line, hoping to hide in the canopy and let the monster get tired of searching for me. My parachute snagged on the top of the trees, and I was thrown about like a puppet dangling from string. Above me, I watched the dark cloud of life fly over top the trees, perhaps trying to find its next meal, and then it disappeared up through the cloud cover and out of sight. I'm not really sure how long I was stranded there. It felt like days. I was too terrified to move and too numb with pain from the shocking fall to consider climbing down. With no cell phone to call for help, I was stuck there for the next few hours until some local campers caught sight of me dangling and they helped me down. They offered me warm food and something to drink as I asked for a phone to call my wife. It didn't really hit me that Trevor was gone until I had to tell her. Tears burst out of my eyes as I passed the phone back. I just simply couldn't stop sobbing from the ordeal that I had gone through. 
The campers took me to a nearby emergency center to get checked for injuries, and authorities promised that they would find Trevor's body wherever it fell. I didn't bother telling them that they wouldn't find it. I knew the sound I heard was like a python crushing its food. My son was gone. Something in the sky had killed him. It's been about a week now since it happened and my family is still recovering from the loss. But none of them know what really happened. All they think I'm experiencing now is just stress and trauma from the event, which is probably partially true. But I can't look up at the sky again and feel safe anymore. I can't hold back the truth much longer, even though I know they'll call me insane. But they need to know. Everyone does. Something unholy and evil is up there in the clouds, waiting to kill us all.